Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Welcome to our Sunday service and a particularly warm welcome to you if this is your first time joining us. Our time together this morning will include some prayers, some songs, hearing from the Bible, a talk for children, as well as something more aimed at adults. Everything you need will appear on the screen, but if you do have a Bible or Bible app to hand, then you might find that useful. Well, hopefully by now you will have seen our website and from that you'll know that we are a church seeking to be a loving community growing in Jesus Christ by word and spirit. A loving community growing in Jesus Christ by word and spirit. Well, this morning our pastor John Parker will be helping us to think through the first of these three elements a loving community. Now, community is a strange concept at the moment. On the one hand, coronavirus has driven a wave of informal volunteering where people are looking out for their friends and neighbours. But on the other hand, surveys tell us that people are lonelier than ever. And the dictionary definition of community is simply a group of people who live in the same place or have certain characteristics in common. But as we'll see a bit later, a loving church community goes far beyond that. So let's sing together a beautiful song which reminds us that as a church, we are a community bound together by the blood of Jesus. Let's sing. Sister, let me wipe your tears Brother, let me bear your fears Come on, every daughter, every son Let us walk in love for we are
Well, hi, Cornerstone Kids. I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to shout out what you think the right answer is. Imagine that you go for a really long, muddy walk. You get mud all in your hair. You get mud all over your clothes and your wellies are so muddy. When you get home, which do you do? Do you take off your muddy boots or do you go straight through the door and walk all round the living room? Which is it? You take your boots off or do you go straight in? What, what do you do? That's right, you take your boots off, don't you? Do you take off your muddy clothes and put some clean clothes on? Or do you just walk straight in with your muddy clothes and, and, and go and sit on the sofa with all the mud all over your coat? Which, which is it? Do you take off your muddy clothes and put clean clothes on or do you just walk in? Oh, that's right. You take Hopefully you take off your muddy clothes, don't you? And if you've got mud in your hair and mud in your armpits and mud everywhere, do you go and have a bath and then enjoy being clean in your pyjamas or something or do you just go straight into the house and, and lie on the floor with your, your muddy hair that's that's right you have a bath don't you well just as your mum and dad want you to be clean to come into their home imagine what it's like for god he wants us not to be dirty in his presence and we do wrong and bad things don't we 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 don't always do the right thing. So to be God's friend, God needs to clean us from all the dirt that is inside to clean our hearts. And we're going to sing a song now that reminds us that that's why Jesus died on the cross. He died to make us clean. So we're just going to sing that song right now. <laughs> Now, our activity for today is to make the Colchester Cross and to remember a little bit of the Bible. Now, the bit of the Bible that we're going to remember is John chapter 13, verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. So I want you to try and learn, try and remember this verse. It goes like this. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. Now let's just say that together, shall we? Love one another as I have loved you. And again, love one another as I have loved you. Now you might need your mum and dad to, to help you with this activity, but if you could write that on a bit, a bit of red card that is that shape, and the red reminds us that Jesus shed his blood when he died to forgive us 
our sins, to, to clean us from all the dirt that's inside us. Just like we come in and mum and dad clean us off, they make sure we take off our, our muddy boots and our muddy clothes and we have a bath if it's got in our hair so that we're nice and clean to be in the family. In, in, in a similar kind of way, God sent Jesus to die on the cross to clean us, to make us clean for his family. And Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood. But we're also going to make a Colchester cross, which is a cross that looks a bit like this. It's green. And we're going to put it on this red background. And uh, <clears throat> your, your mum and dad should be able to help you with this. And what we're going to do is we're going to tie the cross onto the red background. And then we're going to put some pins on the cross as well. So if you do it a bit like that, There we go. So you're going to tie that, that cross on so that the cross is on the red background. And then you need to get some drawing pins and put the drawing pins where the nails would have gone when Jesus died on the cross. So there's one on each side and one on the bottom. So it'll look like that. Can you see the nails down there, the drawing pins down there? And this is most of what uh, the Colchester coat of arms is, for those of you who are wondering why I've, I've done this. So Colchester coat of arms, there's some other things on it, but this reminds us that Jesus died on the cross and the nails uh, went through his body when he died and he, he shed his blood so that we can be clean so that we can be in God's family and as we trust in him we know God's love and we can love one another so let's just say this again love one another as I have loved you I hope you have a load of fun uh, making this um, Colchester cross we're now going to say the Lord's Prayer together this is a prayer that Jesus taught his followers and that we can read in the Bible in Matthew chapter 6. It gives us a really helpful model for when we pray, making sure we remember to praise God for who he is, ask him for forgiveness and rely on him for the things that we need. Perhaps if you haven't already, you could set yourself the challenge this week of learning it off by heart. And if you already know it, Maybe you could use it as a basis for some of your prayers this week. But for now, let's say these words together as they appear on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us at Cornerstone Church Colchester. Uh, my name is John and I'm the pastor and it's my, my real joy and privilege to be bringing God's word to you this morning. Uh, it's the first in a, a series of three sermons that will happen over the next couple of months, looking particularly at our vision. Who are we seeking to be as Cornerstone Church Colchester? So it's appropriate for those of us who are already part of us and for those of us just looking in and, and seeing whether you want to be part of us, um, great that you're considering uh, this sermon. I'm going to be dotting around in the Bible, uh, but we'll be starting in John chapter 13. So do have a Bible with you and open it or open the app on your phone. And uh, let's read from John chapter 13, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I, I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what you need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I gave to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing and wonderful love that you've shown us through your death on the cross. Please open the eyes of our hearts to see your great love for us and the great love you call us to show one another. For your glory's sake. Amen. Well, the Beatles sang, All You Need Is Love. But what do they mean? Uh, Led Zeppelin, maybe more your kind of music, sang, I'm going to give you my love. What kind of love did they mean? Or, and this is more my kind of um, era, the 80s. What did foreigner mean by, I want to know what love is, I want you to show me? Or Whitney Houston, I will always love you. Many would say that since the 60s, the main definition of love has shifted away from self-sacrifice to romantic and sexual definitions. We might even say that since the 60s it's moved even further in in the last couple of decades to just a feeling a feeling of love so a good feeling is love and a bad feeling well that cannot be love now just at the outset we know from the bible and from jesus teaching that god is not against romantic or sexual love quite the opposite god created us as sexual beings to enjoy loving relationships of that nature. But the, the danger with the 60s definition is that faithful love, sacrificial love, divine love is not just minimized, but completely excluded. So when we consider our strapline, a loving community, we need to be clear and, and careful to articulate what we understand love to be. What do we understand love to be? What's our definition of love? Well, it's the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where we see love and the love that we're seeking to show in our community. John chapter 3 verse 34 puts it this way. Do look at it with me. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
How did Jesus show his love for his disciples? Well, the context in John 13 is Jesus knows he's going to leave the world. He knows he's going to go to the cross. And he knows that at the cross, he will cleanse his disciples. And this is why he washes their feet and talks about them being clean. That's the context of John 13. Jesus will show his love of his disciples by dying for them on the cross. And we know that this didn't feel good, don't we, for Jesus? In, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed with, in, with such turmoil that he, he sweated blood, that the capillaries burst, and so the blood went into his sweat ducts didn't feel great. He, he cried out to his father, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way for me to, to save my disciples to, than, than drinking this cup, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is love. And crucifixion did not feel good. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Leaving aside the physical agonies of having nails smashed through your wrists and ankles, Jesus cried out in spiritual agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he cried that out because he was forsaken. The just fury of God's punishment that we deserved was poured out on Jesus so that we who deserved that judgment can instead enjoy the tender-hearted kindness and love of God as a Heavenly Father who welcomes us as his children into his family. Jesus endured the punishment we deserve. He was treated as we should be so that we can be treated as he should be and is the only Son of God. And it's to this kind of love that Jesus calls his disciples to follow in his footsteps to love like this, love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. But we might say, well, but how? Well, the beginning of loving like this is rejecting the idea that love is just a feeling. That's way too com simplistic, isn't it? Love is far more than a feeling. But how are we to love like he loves? I mean, Jesus tells us to take up our crosses to, to follow him to the place of execution and for some Christians in the world that might be literally true but in the context Jesus uses his humble service of washing his disciples feet taking the place of a slave of a servant to picture what love looks like in the practical day to day it's a domestic example that he uses strange that isn't it he also tells them in verse 17 that if they do what he shows them to do, if they follow his example, then they'll be blessed. So we're to be a loving community by sacrificial service of each other, expressed in practical, humble service. Now, this can be expressed in, in all our relationships, can't it? In our marriages, husbands are to lay down their lives for their wives. It means doing the humble, practical, painful jobs, changing nappies, cleaning toilets, taking out rubbish, laying the fires, unblocking drains, whatever it might be. It also means that children's love for parents and parents' love for children is to be in humble service, doing the practical jobs, cooking, cleaning. It means in our friendships, we are to be those who love to do practical, humble tasks to show kindness to one another. See, the biggest problem in the church today is that it does not understand what love is. And why do I say this? Well, the church is largely embracing our culture's definition, our post-60s definition of love. Love is what makes me feel good. If I feel good by behaving this way, sexually, it must be okay, whether that's sleeping with my boyfriend, whether it's leaving my wife, whether it's sleeping with whoever I want to, whether it's prizing vegging in front of the TV ahead of practical tasks of service, whether it's spending money on myself rather than on the church, sacrificially, 
I mean, the Church of England is is heading for bankruptcy, isn't it? See, in church life, the Bible teaches that we need to have a clear understanding of what love is. And love is not just what makes us feel good. It's not true to say if it makes me feel bad, it can't be love. Snow is beautiful, isn't it? I love snow. I, I hope we uh, get some snow. Uh, maybe by the time this goes out, we've had some snow. I'm quite envious of the rest of the country um, being able to go sledging. Um, okay, it has its downsides, but it's beautiful. Many speak of the current generation as the snowflake generation. I, I don't think by that they, they mean that this is the most beautiful generation that's ever lived, but rather that, like snowflakes, there's a hyper-fragility, a, a sensitivity. W whenever somebody is challenged about their feelings and, and their beliefs about their loves, uh, whenever there's disapproval, there is a reaction. This can be expressed in, in no platforming, in, in oversensitivity, in, in horrific online posts. But this is what we get if our feelings become the definition of our love, of our character. It's devastating if we have certain feelings by which we define ourselves to be told that those feelings are wrong. That makes us feel bad. Now, my hope is that as a church, rather than dismissing the snowflake generation, snowflake generation we might embrace the next generation and, and be encouraging them to be true snowflakes. <laughs> what do I mean by that? If it's not already becoming a, a bit cheesy. Well, when God freezes water, he makes every snowflake unique. Trillions and trillions are unique. And, and I think th this is a thirst, a thirst for authenticity, a, a thirst for uniqueness. And yet what the snowflake generation doesn't understand, is this is found in Christ. It's found in God. You see, when God adopts us as his children, we are all uniquely his children. It's not some sort of contract, some sausage machine which processes Christians. No. God welcomes us into his family in Christ. He adopts us. He is kind and tender-hearted towards us. We can define ourselves according to his love and this vast vision of love rather than the narrow post-60s definition of love and self-acceptance, which is following our feelings and being accepted by anybody around us for following whatever we feel to be good. And the way that we're to reach the next generation, the snowflake generation, and, and, and hold forth before them a vision of what it means to be loved by God is to each have a, a, a deep conviction that we are loved and so we can love. Because love is a tough thing. Love is, is something which hurts, which we have to go against our feelings. But how are we to be like this? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 puts it this way. So do turn with that to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Some of the most precious verses in the Bible, I think. See, Paul commands Christians to love. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, Paul commands Christians to be kind. We're to be kind to our spouses, to our children, to our friends, to every generation amongst us. But even to those who rub us up the wrong way in church life, we're to be kind and that won't feel good. We're to be tender-hearted, which doesn't mean overly sensitive. It means we're to be vulnerable to being hurt. We're to have a resilience that enables us to love and be hurt, and to love again and be hurt again, and to keep loving. To be tender-hearted is, is an almost impossible thing in this veil of tears. And we are to forgive each other as God in Christ forgave us. And when we think about what it cost Jesus, the pain that he went through to forgive us, well, then we catch a glimpse of the, the pain it will take for us to, to genuinely forgive others. It's costly to forgive others. It's hard to love others. It doesn't go with 
the currents of our feelings, it often goes against them. So if we're to have this emphasis and this definition of love, well, we need the encouragement of chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that we are dearly loved children. We are tenderly loved by God. We are loved by his kindness, his, his grace. We're dearly beloved children. It's not his begrudging love. It's not some contract of love in which we need to keep our side of the bargain. No, he's kept both sides of the bargain in Christ. And I don't know if you noticed at the end of uh, uh, verse 2, it talks about Christ being a, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We know how costly it is to, to lose our sense of taste and smell, whether we've had COVID or we're reading articles about those who've lost their sense of taste and smell. Life becomes bland, it becomes grey. Well, here is something that is such a wonderful fragrance and and smell that even God is pleased with the fragrance of Christ's sacrifice and offering. The fragrance of Christ's love is something which brings colour and vibrancy and enjoyment and satisfaction to life in this, this generation that is so prone to depression and a loss of enjoyment of anything. Here is something to really enjoy, the love of Christ that brings enjoyment and satisfaction and delight to God himself. So how are we going to have enjoyment and satisfaction in, in life? Well, it's to, to be living lives of this kind of love, following Christ's footstep, forgiving like he has forgiven us, loving like he has loved us, being fragrant to God and to others around us by showing this kind of love, a love that delights God and delights anyone. We are, as Paul says in Corinthians, the fragrance of Christ to others. So isn't this a wonderful love to be called to? A loving community, which means we're committed to loving like Jesus Christ, according to his truth, empowered by him, not following our feelings unquestioningly. But what is going to be the context of our loving relationships? Well, this leads on to our second and final point, and slightly more, uh, slightly shorter, but I think more radical and different. We have a definition of love, which is the cross of Jesus Christ, and a definition of our community, which is houses more and church less, by which I mean church buildings less. And I haven't been able to find a way of putting this very well, so I, do help me to, to have a clear expression and communication of what I'm now going to explain. But this will be at the heart of who we are as Cornerstone Church Colchester. See, where did the key events of God's plan of salvation take place? The key events in Jesus' life and ministry in which he defined love? And the answer is the home, the house. Now, of course, Jesus ministry took place in, in many public places the sermon on the mount jesus was crucified in public he preached in public he went to festivals he did public acts he confronted the pharisees in public but his teaching of his disciples and his nurturing of the the loving community that he began took place in the home in houses whether it's the lord's supper or the resurrection appearances in the upper room with, with Thomas exclaiming, My Lord and my God. Or the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That happened in a house. People were sitting down in the home when the Holy Spirit was poured out. But let's just focus on the Lord's Supper because that uh, was in our text. Luke chapter 22 verse 11 um, outlines how Jesus organised the, the, the location for the last supper so he was intentional about where he was going to celebrate the passover and in luke chapter 22 verse 11 we read this the teacher uh, says to you so this is um jesus instructing his disciples to go and make arrangements with um the host the teacher says to you where is the guest room where i may eat the passover with my disciples and he will show you a large upper room furnished prepare it there in other words jesus chose this place to celebrate the last supper it wasn't in public 
and clearly when they were eating the Passover it was in in the form of a, a Roman triclinium uh, which is a room in in a house uh, what was the Roman triclinium like well it was a central raised area or table on which the food was placed and then those eating did so lying down reclining at table uh, and this is what John records for us in John chapter 13 so turn back there and, and look with me at verse 23. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, this man was the man who wrote John's Gospel, so it was clearly the Apostle John. He was lying down beside Jesus, and they were eating from the table. And Peter says, look, John, just, just find out from Jesus. So you can imagine John leaning back on Jesus' uh, side and whispering in Jesus' ear, you know, who is it, Lord? They were both lying, lying down. This was a domestic environment, the Last Supper. This was where the new covenant began, the new agreement between God and his people that Jesus was to inaugurate by his death on the cross. This is the first Eucharist, the first Lord's Supper, it was in a house, not a church building, not the temple, not a synagogue. And yet we've got to be careful and, and not see this as a purely private environment. Uh, we know this from other parts of the Bible. So turn with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And we pick it up. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table, same kind of environment, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. In other words, Jesus was lying down and, and the woman came in off the street and because he was lying down, she, she could get to his feet behind him and weep over his feet and then pour out the ointment. Now, the Pharisees thought that Jesus would know that this woman who had just come in off the street was, was a notorious sinner and he shouldn't be letting her touch him. But the fact that he did meant he couldn't have been a prophet. And then Jesus teaches the Pharisee Simon about forgiveness and how this woman loves much because she's been forgiven much. Now, we see this again and again that the context of Jesus' ministry and apostolic ministry is, is largely in a domestic environment. And whilst the houses of the day were different, we can't just dismiss that. I mean, Paul talks about his ministry in, in family terms, like he's a father or a, a mother with, with their children. That's how he describes his ministry. And, and he uses words which speak of this domestic context. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, of how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. He speaks of people witnessing his life, him, him sharing not just the gospel, but also his soul, his life, with those who came to faith. In, in the context of a home, people saw his pattern of life. And, and he speaks about this to those who follow in his footsteps to Timothy, a minister in the early church, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. See, these things were witnessed in the domestic environment. And, and so when Paul gives instructions for how the ministry of Jesus and his apostles is to be carried on and, and what the qualification of leaders in the church is to be, he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, An overseer must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? In, in other words, the church is a household. It's God's household. Which is exactly what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. You see, the locus of Christian meeting, the locus and focus of godliness in the New Testament is the household, the home. 
Yes, they were more public than our houses and homes, but no less the context for loving relationships in marriage, in family, in business with wider public access. Does this mean that single people cannot be leaders in the church because they don't have a family? Of course not. The church is our family. Paul was single. Jesus was single. Does this mean that people who cannot own a house cannot be fully involved? Of course not. Jesus rented a house for a bit. Uh, Paul, similarly, was happy to be a guest in people's homes where he conducted his ministry, often house to house. Of course, people can be fully involved as single and as those who rent homes or stay in other people's homes. That's what Jesus did. Paul was happy to be a guest in people's homes and he, he traded in tents so as not to be a burden on anyone. But the church which revolutionised the Roman Empire, the church which was observed to be loving in ways that challenged and changed their surrounding culture, met in homes for the first 300 years. There was no church building before Constantine the Great was converted in about AD 312. There were no church buildings until then. In fact, one of the facets of corrupt religion is its emphasis on money, on church buildings and public gatherings at the expense of genuine loving relationships. It's not that those things are a bad thing. We're not writing off over 1800 year, or 1700 years of church history when the church building became came to the fore. But if church buildings undermine loving Christian relationships, then it's better to commit to loving Christian relationships than to church buildings. See, our commitment at Cornerstone Church Colchester is to love one another in, in a loving community where kindness and practical service, being in each other's homes, is central. Where, where bringing children up in that environment is central, where leadership in the church is tested in that environment as it was in the New Testament where character and godliness are of greater value than upfront public in big buildings oratory it needs to be something which is witnessed in the home now this is not to say that we're not going to gather publicly we will be gathering publicly as we've seen, the, the, the nature of first century houses was that they were a combination of both public and private, with, with pri private family dining that was accessible from the street. Who knows how we're going to replicate that kind of thing? Maybe through the technology that we now have available to us, that the home can be opened out into the public uh, gaze. But our public gathering is to serve our household worship, not the other way around. We are not to sustain a public building at the expense of our household godliness, raising of our children. Now I'm sure there's a better way of putting it than we're committed to houses plus rather than church buildings minus and hopefully you can help me. But we are a loving community seeking to model our love on the love of Jesus Christ and our community on the the focus of Jesus ministry of salvation history see even the dipping of a piece of bread into a dish and the betrayal of Jesus this thing that happened in the domestic environment was part of the prediction of Jesus ministry it's where the locus of his ministry was so let's pray that we show the love of Jesus in the location that Jesus used to teach his disciples about love. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you so much for your great love for us, your kindness to us, your tender heartedness, your endurance, your forgiveness. The depth of your love for us astounds us and Lord we pray that as your beloved children you would help us to show your love like you at the very least in the place that you showed your love for your disciples and explained your love for your disciples and poured out your Holy Spirit and appeared in resurrection power 
Lord, please lead us, teach us, strengthen us to be a loving community for your glory's sake. Amen. Picking up from what we've just been hearing, we're going to have a time of prayer now. It's a good thing that we want to be a community who love and care for each other, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. But we know in our weakness we cannot do this perfectly. Too often our own thoughts, desires and wishes will get in the way of loving others. We'll see this played out in our households, workplaces and even in our church. Let's ask for forgiveness now from the one holy and righteous God, particularly thinking about how we don't love him with our whole hearts and how our sin gets in the way of loving others as we love ourselves. Let's say the words of the confession prayer together now. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. In the book of Romans, we find these words. He, that's Jesus was delivered over to death for our sin and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Because of Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, we stand forgiven by the grace of God. Amen. Let's join in the words of the set prayer for this Sunday. Heavenly Father, keep your household, the church, continually in your true religion so that we may lean only on the hope of your heavenly grace and always be defended by your mighty power through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we continue in prayer for our community and for the world around us. Dear God, thank you for the people around us you have blessed us with to be part of the church family here at Cornerstone Church, Colchester. Help us to love each other with a love that surpasses understanding and to be a witness to the world as that love goes out to those around us too, showing others the love you have for each and every person of this world. Help us to always have in our minds the need for those who don't yet know you to hear the gospel of grace, and for us to be bold in sharing our faith with them as the most loving thing we could do for them, as we point them to the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the coronavirus figures are slowly starting to come down again and we ask for your strength to keep us persevering in our lockdown lives. Help us to be serving those around us in whatever ways we can in our individual situations, remembering that we are serving you as we serve each other. We cry out to you to bring an end to the pandemic so that we can return to so many aspects of our life that have been missing over the last year or so. And we know that no matter where we are or what we're doing, you will not leave us or cast us aside. Thank you for this wonderful, steadfast love you have for your people in both the good times and the more challenging ones. Father, as we think about where you may be leading your church here, we consider how and when we may be able to meet up as a group in person and ask for you to be blessing these plans and the homes we plan to meet up in. But more than this, we ask that you'll be defining our time together by a true and deep love for one another and the Lord Jesus, and that nothing would distract us from this. 
Help us to consider wisely the resources you've given us as a church, both material and financial, and think carefully about how they can be used for your glory. Now, in a moment of quiet, we bring to you those on our minds who are in need of knowing you right now for any number of reasons. Where there is pain, provide healing. Where despair, give hope. And where brokenness, bring restoration. For the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen.
to say goodbye. I do hope you've enjoyed the service this morning and if you're a regular you'll know it's almost time for a caffeine hit and catch up at our Zoom coffee and chat. If you're new we would love for you to join us. We usually log on for about 20 minutes or so after the service to say hello, find out how our weeks have been, hear how the children got on in their activities and sometimes discuss what we heard in the service. It's very relaxed and if, like me, you have a small child who likes to fill the screen with a Gruffalo toy or announce loudly to everybody that they need the toilet, then please don't worry, you are in good company. As I said, it's very relaxed. You will need the Zoom link, so please do drop us an email on this address and we can get that over to you. So hopefully I'll see you all shortly. But if not, we'll see you next week.